is Dion Bates, and I want to welcome you to the new and emerging teacher cadre for special educators. Uh, today, we're going to talk about establishing baseline and goal writing. And so we have Chastity Craft, who's our literacy consultant with us today, and Stephanie Kidd, who is our math consultant. Both of those ladies are going to talk about what that looks like for how we establish baseline. So we're uh, going to look at reading and mathematics. And I hope that that will be very helpful for you as we're uh, working through figuring out how to do baseline and progress monitoring and the support that you might need around that. We have some of our other special education team that are here. We have Brenda Combs, she's the other director here at the co-op. And we have Denny Paul May, who is our due process consultant. And we have Doug Smith, our behavior consultant. So we're all here. If you have questions and want to stop us at any point and ask questions, then you uh, feel free to do that. And uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. So I'm going to turn this over to Chastity. Welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. So we'll get right into it. Um, our learning intentions for today is we're going to talk about baseline data, what it is, how you're going to determine your baseline, and we're going to talk about some methods of measurement that you can use to determine your baseline, uh, just an overview of those because there, there are several, and we'll uh, talk about the different types that we have and how to use those and then we're going to uh, use that baseline data and show you how to use that to write a goal and so we'll take you through each of those steps so the first thing is what is it you I'm sure you guys have heard about baseline data and or you've different forms or say that you need it but what exactly is it and baseline data is just your initial quantifiable, quantifiable information on students progress so basically when you first get a student it is you have you use your probes or um, ass assessments to gather their starting points for where they are you do that so that you can compare their progress when when you start and then the progress that they make uh, baseline data is used um, at the beginning if you are doing students that may be getting um, getting interventions. So in that maybe your the pre referral your RTI that your regular education teachers may be doing, they will also establish that baseline data um, because you need to see where they are the starting point and to know if they're making that progress. This can also be done if you your initial IP, if you need some information to a starting point to write a goal, then that you would do some assessments for your baseline data for that. So that is what essentially baseline data is. It's your, your initial information that you have for students. And, and the term quantifiable is important because it has to be measurable. So, you know, just um, make sure that whatever data that you have, you can, it, you can have, um, it's measurable for that. Stephanie is going to talk a little bit on how you establish your baseline. Okay, Chastity's been talking uh, about what is a baseline. Well, I think of baseline data as a bridge, and it is just one of our components in our present level. OK, so if we think about our present level data that we have, of course, we always have their strengths, we have their concerns or their needs, and we have an adverse effect along with the baseline data. So that baseline data is that bridge that we have that actually connects our all that information to how are we going to write a goal for this student. So think of baseline data as your bridge. Um, when I'm thinking about how do I identify that target skill? That is one of the things. What is the need of that child to accomplish what they need to in mathematics? What is the need of the child to be able to read uh, different information that, that they may need for even social studies, for science, those kind of things, or in class? So we are looking at what is the need, and that targeted skill has to be measurable. Behavior has to be measurable. We have to make sure we can observe it in some way. And then, of course, we are going to look at and let... The other thing is, let's not confuse baseline data for um, the Wyatt, the Brigant, the K uh, KT, the key math that you do, or even the um, uh, Woodcock. Sometimes those are things that we do. Those are not baseline data material. Baseline data materials are probes that are created, CBMs that are done, and they are done a couple of times, 
preferably three to four so that you can get a good measure for your student. And we want to make sure that we're doing that. And I have uh, recommended several things. We use EZCBM for one. Um, in mathematics, of course, I would look at what some other probes that may be available for me to use that's consistent with the goal that I'm going to be measuring. So that's what we want to think about for this. So determining that baseline data and we want to find an average. So in many times, if we do it too quickly and we don't separate it out, we don't get a good understanding. So first, the thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look at what is the needs of that student and I'm going to identify a skill or a behavior that I'm going to work on. And then second of all, I'm going to take a couple of samples and when I say a couple of samples, then it's going to be over time. And Denny Paul has preached this several times that we want to do this over time. And one of the reasons why we want to do this over time is we don't want to get something that is not going to be challenging. And we don't want to get something that is not going to be attainable for that student. And we're going to, we're going to make sure if we get this over time that it allows for a good trend line that the student is actually going to be progressing with. It's not going to be a trend line in which they're going to automatically go and easily attain it. So we want it to be one challenging, but we want it to be attainable and over a year because that's what our typical IEP goals are written for is one year. So we want to think about that. And so how do I do that? Like I said, you're going to first of all, choose that target the skill. Second of all, you're going to choose the correct tool to measure that skill. Now, Chastity has talked about that there's different probes out there for reading. I've talked about there's different probes out there for math. Um, you can get those. EZCBM has them. Uh, for me, it's um, Forefront Education has some different probes that you can use. There are different things that you can use to or develop your own probes that you're going to give a couple of times. So that's going to be it. And then basically, like I said, you're going to take an average of at least three to four. And at that point, you're going to look at where do I want this kid to get to? So if they're working at 50%, can they get to 80% by the end of the year? And Ms. Chas, can you advance this? These are some examples of some baseline data that we have. I'm going to go ahead since I'm already on here and talk about the map one. The math one, we uh, we base this one on, of course, I talk about the map scores that he has and he's working on a fifth grade level and he's very low, but we base it on EZCBM, which demonstrates that he is at 50% accuracy on computational based curriculum measures at the fifth grade level. That's where he's working at right now. Now he is the seventh grade student, Robert is, and he is demonstrating concerns in multiplication division and interpreting uh, two-step problems, but shows strength in addition and subtraction. So we know based on EZCBM, we've given him several, several probes and he's got to the fifth grade and he's consistently at 50%. So what do we need to work on? And this is going to lead over into my goal, which is either going to be interpreting two-step problems or it's going to be with multiplication and division. So Chastity. Okay, so Mine is the writing and the reading. And for the writing, I know that one is very difficult. Um, it was more difficult for me when I was in the classroom, just, and it seems to be more difficult um, when I talk to teachers out in the districts. It's just um, to, to think of writing as getting something that you can get a percentage from. It's difficult. So for this particular one, I do want to show you a paragraph writing checklist in a way that you can um, quantify their uh, progress. So before I do that, I will talk about what the baseline is. So Harry, he, we used a paragraph writing checklist and he scored 70 or 65%. And he demonstrates the concerns and correct use of punctuation and grammar. And spelling is a relative strength for Harry due to few spelling errors. And as we mentioned, uh, Denny Paz mentioned before, maybe even last month, if you were here with us, is, you know, to think of a relative strength for a student. Uh, so when we say that Harry has few spelling errors, that doesn't necessarily mean that he's on grade level for spelling, but in compared to um, ability and his other strengths and needs, then 
the spelling could be a strength compared to his other areas. So I wanted to show you this paragraph writing checklist that we have because like I said, I think it's um, sometimes writing can be difficult. So what you could do is you look at the, um, at the paragraph that he writes and then it's just like a, a yes or a no. And this is just an example. You don't have to use this one, but it just gives you something to, to go by. You're looking at his ideas. Do they stay on topic? Does he have details? And you just check yes or no. Same way with organization. And you just look at those and you just check them, yes or no. And then it goes down to the, the sentence fluency, your grammar, punctuation, vocabulary, and spelling. And, um, you know, in that way, after you check your yeses and nos, then you get your total. I think there are 21 possible uh, yeses that he can get. And then you would check how many yeses out of the 21 that he received. And that's, and then you, that's how you would get your percentage on, and make that for, to write your baseline and then ultimately get your goal for him. And then that's also how you can look at your strength also. So if they have more yeses in the category of spelling or ideas, then that would be a strength. So this is an example of a, of a paragraph writing checklist that you can use. Okay, and then for reading, you can have, we used oral, readings, oral reading fluency pro, which would be a curriculum-based measure, a CBM, and Ron's oral reading fluency pro determined that he reads a fifth grade text at 110 words correct per minute. This puts him in the 50th percentile and the fall norms for fifth grade fluency. But Ron is presently in the seventh grade. So we can take that information and determine that he is two grade levels behind in reading fluency. And so you notice we have the, we know exactly where they fall based on what the norms are and how many he has and compared to the grade level. With this one, um, he had put in here that he's going to use an event recording for Susie uh, because she turns in, when she turns in her assignments, it's only half completed. So that is definitely something that needs to be addressed. So now we have the example of baseline and we talked about these methods of measurements. Now we're gonna talk about, give you an example of what those look like. So you have um, your methods of measurement are categorized into essentially four different categories that fall under direct measures, curriculum-based measurements, indirect measures, and authentic assessment. Note at the bottom, it is very important to note that if you use an authentic assessment, this has to be paired with another method of measurement. So for example, if you wanted to use student work samples or just an interview for that to, um, to have as your assessment, you have to use some other kind of um, goal to, or measurement to go with that. Uh, for example, um, I would use maybe like a checklist. Um, and, and if you notice on here, the checklist can be a direct measure or an indirect measure. And the difference between that is a direct measure is when you are actively observing the behavior being, being done. If you can watch it happen and see it happen, you're there for it, then you can use a direct measure. Like for example, a direct measure, um, you can see on here that it's talking about like the duration, the latency and things like that. It's mostly is like when we, the first time when you say behavior, I think sometimes, and I did this as a young teacher, I was always thinking it would be like an actual, like off task or if they were talking or if it was, the, it, you know, that type of um, behavior. But when we talk about the behavior, we're talking about if they, the reading section, the math, are they completing problems? Are they um, doing the fluency? Is it 
Are they reading words? Are they following the correct punctuation? That is also technically a behavior. And we'll get into that a little bit more too when we talk about the goal. But the, um, if you notice on the checklist, it is listed under a direct measure and also under an indirect measure. So for example, the paragraph writing checklist that I just showed you, that is an example of an indirect measure because you did not see the student, you weren't there, you're looking at their permanent product, you're looking at their paragraph and using that checklist to um, get your information. So that would be an indirect measure. An example of a checklist for a direct measure is if you are um, like the um, reading, if they are, you have a word list and you are actually listening to them read those words to you aloud, then you could check off that they, yes, they read that. That would be an example of a direct measure checklist. And Stephanie, you or Doug, Denny Paul can also chime in and give some more examples of that because obviously I'm going to give all reading examples because that's what I, that's what I do. <laughs> so uh, I think it's important to note uh, how these methods of measurement fit with uh, the goal monitoring tab in Infinite Campus. Uh, if you haven't been exposed to that, you will be soon. Um, and it's, you know, I don't want to get down a rabbit hole here, but just thinking about counting things, um, you know, with event recordings and then counting how long a behavior lasts with duration recordings. And then if there's any type of latency or any delay in a student's response to a prompt or a cue would be a latency recording. And those are all embedded within your goal monitoring tab. And so we can help you with that. It's a little bit confusing because the language is a little bit different. But just, just understanding if you're counting how many times a child gets a sentence correct, that's an event recording. Um, and if you're counting how long a behavior lasts, that's a duration recording. And if you're measuring that time in between the time that the prompt's given and the behavior initiates, then that's latency. And so sometimes when, we, uh, when we're thinking about progress monitoring and, and doing baseline, it's very important to, to be able to understand what each tool measures. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it, the, this is a great list because this is lots of what we do here. And I'll just hush, but I, you know, I'm really impressed with the way this is laid out. I think it's, uh, it's very straightforward and it's very easy to understand. But, you, you know, it's just like anything else. You got to understand the language of what we're trying to accomplish and understand the words. And sometimes those words are, are not as, for, uh, not as maybe, a, um, uh, maybe we're not using those in everyday language and, and we're not using those as frequently as we would other words in our language. So we have to do some background reading and determine what those things are, even on a deeper level to be able to understand progress monitoring. Uh, Judy Paul, one of the one one of the things I want to add is uh, with direct measures, like Chastity said, the teacher's going to be right there with them. And that's a big part of it. And many times I like to use math probes that were direct measures due to the fact that I was with the student and I understood the thinking that was going on. So I could sit there with the student while they're taking the, you know, the probe and they're working through the probe and I would ask questions, well, how did you get that? Uh, what, how did you know to do that? Uh, what, what's some information that you can give me about this problem? especially if they're having trouble with that. I mean, I don't want them to change their answer and I'm on a market as they didn't understand it, but I'm going to know how they're thinking and then I can change my instruction. I can change whatever the SDI is that's needed to be changed at that point in time to help that student to uh, progress. That's a, that's a great point. And I wanted uh, to show you also the information, it can, this comes from the guidance document. And if you're not familiar with this document, you need to be. <laughs> um, <laughs> I would recommend, um, it is found on uh, the KD website, but also we, we have it linked in several of our areas and we will put this link on our our Google site as well so that you can have it and download it and have it available to you this and then there's also um, a 
we call it the schoolhouse document that has um, great information for you. So this is, will guide you and help you with a lot of the terminology that we've been talking about and also goes into, well, what it says. It guides you on how, what components need to be in your IEP and how to make those compliant. And then like on page 44 talks about the methods of measurement. So we wanted to kind of give you the, um, the resource of where you can find this information and go back to to help you when you're writing your IEPs. I'll also say that, you know, we have the KVEC, KVEC coaching uh, tool, the IEP tool that is a companion to that IEP guidance document that breaks a lot of this stuff down. And a lot of our agendas that we do from time to time when we do our trainings, we'll link a lot of these things that explain uh, on a deeper level uh, in our resources page. Um, what, what those methods of measurement mean and that type of thing. So we do have a lot of resources we, and we're lo we love to share. We love to just get out there and, and, and try to provide everything that you guys are going to need because this is a hard job. It, it definitely is. Uh, I, at the end, we do have um, the Google site that's got the, the, our new teacher cadre recordings and resources that so we can maybe link on there as well. We try to link them in several different places so that we, like Danny Paul said, we want to share them. We want to get those out so that you have, you need them and we want them that, for you to have them readily available for you to help you um, do your, do your job. That is very, very difficult. You have a huge task and um, we want to try to make it as easy for you as possible. Once you gather that data, your baseline data, now you have to um, establish where they are and then you need to write a goal for that, that student. And uh, like Stephanie had pointed out earlier, you, um, you have to make it um, attainable. You know, you, you don't want to make it too, e uh, too hard, and, but you also don't want to make it too easy as well. So Chastity, let me add one thing. So if they're getting this baseline data and they're doing a great job with it, and good example is we know that the little boy that I was talking about just a minute ago was working at a, a fifth grade level, right? And I want it to be attainable. So when I get ready to write this goal, I'm going to go back and I'm going to use my standards. And I'm going to look at on the fifth grade level, what should he be doing at this point? But if I'm going to make this a little bit more challenging, maybe I'm going to look at the sixth grade level, even though he's all, he's already at the seventh grade level. So thinking about those standards and how you can use that baseline data to get to that, you need to make sure that you understand your standards and, wh and where that child is. And so that's really complicated for a lot of us because I know at one point I had fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade math. So I had to know all the standards for all of those grades. So that's important for us to keep that in mind, uh, that you need to know your standards and know where your baseline is so that you can make them, uh, again, challenging but attainable. That is a very good point, Stephanie. I'm glad you mentioned that about the standards because you have to, that those progressions and, and it may even be um, something like she said, if you're uh, on a same, if, it's a seventh grade student and they're not on the seventh grade, you still, you have to look at that seventh grade standard, see what's expected of him, see what skill he is lacking um, to, in order to get, help him meet that standard and then back up and get the lower level standard. So yes, that is a very good point that you made. So let's look at some examples of goals here. Um, and this is a very busy slide, but once we talk through it, I think it'll make some sense to you. We took the baselines that we had, the examples that we talked about earlier, we used that information and made the goal. So for the first one, it was writing and his weaknesses was the um, punctuation and grammar, and that falls under the category of conventions in writing. So that's thus that's why we have used correct conventions, and that would it would fall under the the grammar and the punctuation. Uh, so then we also color coded it. So at the top of the screen, you will see the A, B, C, D, E, and F, which are the five components of the goal. Uh, we did and 
we didn't um, write in what each of those mean because we wanted to kind of see if you guys would remember what those are because I know that um, I mean last month we talked about them and, and maybe in so if you were here with us last month we it would be a review for you and then um, if you have basically written an IEP at this point then you would have these components in it so to tell us what each of the letters are you can start with a so what do you think a would stand for and by looking at the goals that we have written you might could it might give you a clue on um, like if you have Harry is a then what would a stand for what do you guys think so a is your audience okay what about b b is for your behavior and now this is let's talk about this uh this for just a second like i had mentioned earlier you know when you think behavior you think of you know getting out of their seat or throwing paper wads or tapping their pencil or things like that but if you look at the goals that we have on the screen the behavior is what they're going to doing they're going to be writing they're going to be reading they're going to be solving math problems so anything that they're actively doing is the behavior and it has to be measurable Okay, what about C, circumstance? And then uh, D, what about our D? Degree, yes, good job. Degree and criteria, very good. And the E? Evaluation. Yep. Yay. <laughs> and the last one of F, what would be your, what was, does the F stand for? Frequency, good job, guys. You guys are on it. We color-coded our goals uh, to make sure that we, included all of the components in a goal to be compliant and then so with the first one with the writing when given a writing prompt harry will write using correct conventions in sentences he, with 80 percent accuracy over three consecutive sessions as measured by weekly paragraph writing checklist so the paragraph writing checklist is the example that i showed you and we want him to he's going to write correct sentence or write sentences correctly with 80% accuracy using the correct punctuation, uh, capitalization, and grammar. Three consecutive sessions. Baseline was 65. So I'm not expecting him to be perfect, but he's going to, he's wanting, I want him to reach that 80% in the writing. And then I'm going to do that by when I look at that writing checklist, I will go and look at his sentences and does he and I will check off yes or no and then I will score that using however check count how many yeses he has compared to the 21 total that he could possibly have and that's how I would get my number okay then my reading one uh, or we noted that he is at 50th percentile in the fall norms on the fifth grade level so we want him to um so he's not mastered fifth grade yet so that's why at this point i'm still going to give him that fifth grade reading passage because he's not he's not quite there yet so i'm going to give him a fifth grade reading passage and ron is going to read 179 uh, words correct per minute and i went with 179 because i look because we were looking at the fall norms earlier so the fall norms for fifth grade, to get him into that 90th percentile, he would read 179. He's going to do that three out of four times that when I uh, have him read to me. Then, um, and I'm going to do that weekly. And I'm going to use a CBM, the Oral Reading Fluency Probe, to measure to see how many words correct per minute that he gets. Okay, Steph. So with mine, I am looking at the fact that he is doing, again, he's on fifth grade level, but one of the things that we looked at on his baseline was that we wanted him to be able to do word problems, right? Uh, because he's having trouble interpreting two-step problems. So when given 20 math problems, of course, we're going to work within 20. I try to sometimes only work within 10. Robert's going to solve 
math word problems with 80% accuracy, four out of five trials is measured weekly by math probes. And I talked about this earlier that I like to use math probes just because of the fact that we most of the time like for those to be a direct measure where we're sitting there with the students so we know what they're thinking. Um, many times it's the questions that you ask, not just the problems that's given that allows you to change that SDI or allows you to actually understand what I need to teach the student next or what's those next steps or what's the misconception that they have. So like I said, for, for me, that's what I'm gonna look at and make sure that I'm doing for that student. So Doug was looking at this child as not completing their math assignment. So we knew that she was only turning in like half of it. That's all she's doing. So when presented with an assignment of 20 math problems, she's going to complete all problems uh, on four out of five assignments as measured by weekly event recording. So in this case, we are going to do an event recording. She's turning an assignment. Did she do all of the math problems? And so she has to do four out of five assignments for her to be able to be um, proficient at this. Okay, we've made a little, a little trivia game for you guys. I'm gonna let Steph talk, uh, tell you how we're gonna do this one. Okay, so in the uh, chat, you're gonna say yay or nay. Yay means yes, I can measure this goal. Nay means no, it is not measurable. Now, if you say yay, fine, we can do that. But if you say nay, tell us why not. So. First one up, Ms. Chas, is this one measurable? When given a writing prompt, Tony will increase his writing ability on three out of four consecutive trials as measured by a weekly writing rubric. Yay, it is measurable. Nay, it is not measurable. We've got a lot of nays. The word increase, that is so true. It's not measurable. Yeah increasing from what you don't know where he is you don't know where he's going so you have it has to be specific on um where you want them to be so yes so you do not please do not use increase in your in your goals okay next one given 100 high frequency words thor will correctly read 80 out of 100 words on four of five consecutive times as measured by weekly reading checklist. And it is yay because you can, you are measuring the 80 out of 100. You can measure that. Okay, next one. Given a penny, nickel, dime, and a quarter, Loki will match coins to their corresponding value with 80% accuracy on eight out of 10 attempts as measured by math probes. And yes, we can measure this because we can actually have him to match these up. We can see that he's creating those with corresponding values. And so he can do this. Okay, I think we've got one more, right? In the regular classroom, Hank will improve positive social interactions by uh, using age appropriate behavior with 80% accuracy as demonstrated on frequency recording on four out of five consecutive <laughs> days. days. We've missed a word. <laughs> <laughs> the key to this one I think that we need to talk about Chas is that word improve positive social interactions right it's actually multiple words and is there something specific about positive social interactions that we're going to look at you would need to be able to operationally define what that is so, just need to ask yourself is it measurable can you see it can you count it can you hear it can you time it and I was thinking that about the word appropriate, the same, that, you know, that's the same kind of thinking is what is appropriate? What does that mean? Right. Is it eye contact? Is it shaking hands? Is it waiting turns? So we technically can't measure this one because it needs to be, um, somebody said it's too vague. You're right. It is very vague. It's leaving a lot to interpretation, right? Yeah, and like, like Dion had mentioned, you know, the appropriate behavior, instead of using the terms appropriate behavior, then you want to be specific in saying, um, making eye contact or um, taking turns in conversation or, yeah, the behavior that you want to see. What, what is it that you want them to do specifically, not just appropriate, because it can be interpreted different by different people. So... 
one of the other things I would point out too is, is the specificity of the circumstance. Uh, sometimes uh, d- we don't want to set ourselves up with our circumstance to not be able to actually capture the data that needs to be captured. Um, you know, so if you're going to be, in, are you going to be in the regular classroom five consecutive days uh, or four? You, you see what I'm saying? Because you don't want to write it in such a way that it, you can't measure it. That's a very good point. Yeah. yeah that's a good point. Uh, if that student misses, then that starts all back over again, even though they'd had really good interactions up to that point. And then we have a day that they're absent that could even mess up them being able to be measured. Dion, do you want to show them the, the Google side and talk a little bit about that? and show Because we've got some new addition there. Yeah, I do. I wanted to just make sure they knew how to access those resources. Um, and so Stephanie, <clears throat> excuse me, and Chastity both have worked extremely hard to, to get us updated on this. And I wanted to make sure you guys knew how to access the information from our Google site. So I'm going to put that on the screen and then I'll share that with you. So um, just making sure that you guys know how to access this. Um, the Holler Boys, and that's what we refer to our, our tech team here at KVEC, have kind of revisited the tabs and the way our page looks. And so if you will see now, instead of on that drop down menu here, now we have a tab for each one of our areas. So if you go to special education and you click that tab, um, here what you will be able to find, always find the link for our new and emerging teacher cadre. And so here's the link for today's session. And then this one is the link to access for um, the session in December. So I just wanna make sure you guys knew how to access those. But the other important thing is here, you will find there is a tab for new and emerging teachers and you click that tab and all of the sessions that we've had up to this point are, are archived here. So if you miss them and you want to go back or you, re, you know, you wanted to go back and revisit it because you wanted to some more learning around it. Cause that kind of happens to me. Sometimes I, I listen to something and I have to sometimes go back and re-listen when I have a few minutes to process it. So well, these are all available for you. So that, that was our September one. There's the one for October. And you'll see that they've linked the PowerPoint. They have linked the, uh, like Chastity talked about the past assessment. So she linked that one. Um, Stephanie has put those links for those screeners for math. And we've also had that quick phonics screener in there. So all of those are available for you. Same thing with the PowerPoint. You can go back and access those. Any of those sessions that we've had the previous school year, are all here available for you as well. So I wanted you to know where to access those. Here's one on IEP, here's one on Infinite Campus. And it was um, Regina Brown, who's one of our directors of special education in Letcher County that just walk, talks us through Infinite Campus and, and the use of those tabs and, and uh, supporting their learn, your learning around that. And you can watch it again. Those are all an hour or less sessions. So that's the good thing about it. It's just a real quick learning. And if you see something you want to go back and revisit, it's a good opportunity to do that. So I want to make sure you knew that. And let's go back here. So any of the other, like any of the conferences that we've had conducted over the last, what, I guess a couple of years mm -hmm. are all linked here. So if you go to virtual conferences, so let's say there was a session and you were not able to attend all the sessions for the fall conference. You can go here and link and have access to all of those sessions. So there is a quiz linked to each one of those sessions or a, there's a feedback that's linked to each one of those sessions that uh, you can complete after watching those. You can complete that. And upon completion of that, if you've correctly entered your email, you will receive a certificate for your participation. And so if you need evidence of that for that six hours for fall um, credit for uh, your um, emergency and probationary, you can get that certificate there and then you can share that with your director of special education. But all of the sessions are now here. This one's the one back from the summer. And then these are the ones back from previous previous years. So these are all, uh, you know, they all have really good sessions. They're all still very relevant they're all um, helpful for a new teacher. So I just wanted you to know where those were at and how to access those. And then if you're looking for something specific, uh, you can click on behavior. Uh, you can see some of those things around behavior. And so there's all kinds of uh, real quick videos that you can watch. We try to put those in 
uh, kind of a, a snippet is what we refer to those, but a real quick picture or some real quick learning for you. So it, it doesn't take a lot of time, but that you can learn some of those things around behavior. Uh, let's see, let's take a look at literacy. Here's literacy, the same thing. Um, here's some phonological awareness. There's, and it'll give you a description of what those sessions are. Here's Chastity, and she's sharing some concepts of uh, phonemic awareness, concepts of spoken words. So there's all these quick videos that kind of teach you how to do those. Um, there's her vocabulary series. Same thing. So for mathematics, there is a link. And that link is available. And then that is, there is all that content there. It's available for you as well. One other thing I wanted to share with you is that if you wanted to look at due process, and there is a due process. And so here is transition record review training. Here is uh, IEP series part one and part two. If you're having trouble with IEP, this is a great uh, opportunity for you to go back through that the IEP process and hear someone talk through that process and help you kind of think and frame that. Um, and, and you can stop it, pause it, replay it. And so it's accessible and you can just listen to it over and over. And then here's some other things. You know, these are something things around accommodations. Here's some things around uh, writing a present level. There's specially designed instruction. So tons and tons of resources that we just wanted to make sure you guys were aware of and let you know where you could find the links for the uh, new and emerging teacher. So you can get back to those. So just wanted to share that with you. I don't know if Chastity and Stephanie had anything else or Denny or Brenda or any of our KVEC team that's on here. I wanted to talk about anything else on that establishing baseline and progress monitoring and then and goal writing and progress monitoring. So I'll stop right there and see if there's anyone else that wanted to, to talk a little bit about uh, any of the content we had for today. I just wanted to piggyback on what Stephanie had said about standards. Um, I was working today with, with a new teacher um, and we were uh, writing a present level. And one of the things that he was really trying to get his head wrapped into was where do I find strengths on skills for a student that has an intellectual disability? And so I pointed him to the standards and I said, you know, if the student we've established through the map data and we've established through those overall screeners and, we, and the, the information that we have in front of us, maybe it's an achievement test that's telling us that this student's having problems with uh, word fluent, fluency or if they're having problems with uh, computation and mathematics or whatever it might be. If, we, if we've established that they're working pretty much on a second grade level, then we might look back to the first grade level to find some of those strengths in those skills and in those standards. Those are the things that are pertinent to the learning. And so when we're looking at academic performance, it, it, it really helps us to understand how important it is that we know what the standards say, or at least we have links and we can get to those standards and we can determine what the gaps are because those standards are linked and they're stair-stepped and they're progressive. And so, you know, what might be a strength for one student on the first grade relative to themselves, we could, we could include that if we're struggling finding those strengths. And, and I just wanted to say that. And I think we need to keep always in mind that everything we do is guided by the standards. And we, uh, we have consultants that do a great job with helping with that. And I just wanted to throw that in there. Thank you. Um, I wanted to say real quick too, I dropped in um, a document because we were talking about um, new teachers as needing if you because you meet on here and you guys don't get a chance to really talk to each other a whole lot you listen to us mostly um so we wanted to make a document just for you to if you wanted to put your information in it's just your name and um email because uh this is like a little community um like your own little plc for new and emerging teachers um so if you wanted to um, be able to reach out to other teachers and get ideas from each other uh, that you can do that instead of have to go through what I mean we would be glad to but sometimes you just need to reach out to other teachers especially if you have um, if you're in a small district you may be the only four or five special education teacher in your school so 
you may want to have that other because people are other and fellow teachers are ultimately one of your most valuable resources that you can have in education. So if you wanted to just put your information in there in that way that um, just to have that available to you, you, you're more than welcome to put that in there. So that was the form that I put in there um, a few minutes ago. And that's all I have. <laughs> I am going to go ahead and drop the feedback link in the chat so that you guys could fill that out for us. Um, we would greatly appreciate that. I, I'm going to add one thing, Chastity. Jenny Paul, you were talking about the standards just a few minutes ago. And one of the great things about the, ma the new math standards is if you know where a student is, and there's actually a search button up there that you can type in like something that you're looking for in the math standards and it'll take you to it. But there's a great little thing on there. It's called the progression, where the progressions are. And so if you look at the grade level that you're on, you can go back a standard and you can continue to go back into where that student actually is. So you can actually see the progression in that. So it's a wonderful way for our teachers to think about that. And we have on our site, uh, Vonda Adams did several about the progressions uh, how the standards is set up and how to do that progression. So if you have any of those questions, you can go to the mathematics um, button there and then look for standards and it'll be right there. And that power of the word relative is so important when we're writing strengths for students that have intellectual disabilities. So, you know, you may be thinking, uh, if I'm comparing this kid to the age expected performance on grade level, uh, it's going to be hard to find something positive to write, but uh, we're thinking comparing to themselves and their actual performance and how they do in that particular subject area. And so it's very, very important to use that powerful word relative strength when we think about that. And I'm going to hush. I just, I, I do want to say one more thing. Um, Stephanie talked about the math progressions and the standards. So the language arts, the, the reading and the writing standards are in the same, same format. You can look, you can start at, so if I have a student in the seventh grade and that student's performing on the second grade, how do I look at what those standards are for, you know, I start with where are they at? Second grade, third grade, fourth grade. I start looking at those skills that they need to be able to, to, um, to be able to participate at that grade level. So I know where they're going. They, I may not be able to get them all the way to that grade level seventh grade, but I know where they're going. And I know how to, to then scaffold what I do as a special ed teacher. I know how to do specially designed instruction and I know how to scaffold my instruction because I know what the aim is. That's what the goal is, is to move as close as I can to grade level standards. So it helps me understand that that progression and then it helps you to kind of figure out what that discrete skill is what that skill that you need what do they need to know the most in that content area to move them as far as as we can so we've just talking about that that's going to be some we're going to offer some standards work just for special education teachers coming up in the content areas uh, that we were just talking about that today we go schedule that and that so you guys can be looking for that we'll do some uh, uh, be constructing of standards and helping us to understand how we can use that skill. And um, I think Dean Paul calls that a, a funneling process, how you get down to those skills, but how you can use the standards to drive that uh, decision-making process for us. So we know where the kid sh should be, where the kid is at, and then how we're going to get them there between, how we're going to bridge that gap. So I think that's all I had. If anybody else has anything else, and if not, if you get your feedback form completed, we appreciate you. And we're glad that each of you were here with us today. And, and we appreciate the opportunity to work with you. And if you need any of us, our team's here. We're happy to help.